Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we are bringing you a special one. Uh, it is a behind-the-scenes facts about Mark Fagan, a Russian opposition figure famous for his daily YouTube coverage of the war in Ukraine. How did he meet Aristovich? Why is Russian government threatening to kill him? What advice did he give Navalny after the poisoning? How does Mark plan to return to Russia? Find out in this interview by popular Ukrainian blogger Ramina Eshagzai. Original interview aired in June, on the 12th of June this year, and this one is brought to you by the voice of N. Enjoy. You are now very active on YouTube, give a lot of expert interviews, so I'd like to get a little more information about you, since some people had discovered you only after the start of the full-scale war in Ukraine. So, I ask my subscribers to pose questions for you. Their questions were all the same, so I will need to ask you again about Aristovich. But let's start with another topic. How did you enter the information space of Ukraine? I focus only on political affairs. That's why those who followed politics in Ukraine already knew me more or less. Of course, even a little before the war, people started paying more attention to the commentators like me who were on both sides. I'm part of the opposition, but I'm also a public figure. The interest to us had increased because people had to understand what was going to happen, and so I kind of became an expert in this field. Although, again, I'm a prejudiced expert, I'm on the side of Ukraine, so it's difficult to talk about some objectivity. I generally do not understand how that can work, especially in the conditions of war. You are either in this trench or the other. You cannot be in the middle running zigzags. That would not work. But when the war started, I actually just continued to do what I was already doing. I had a political channel on YouTube, medium-sized, with perhaps about 350,000 subscribers. They were a loyal audience. We had streams every day. This is the unique feature of my channel. Nothing is pre-recorded. It's a direct live conversation. And when the war began, the same Alexei Aristovich continued to take part in my streams. He was already participating in my programs from time to time before the war as an advisor to the president and as an independent commentator when he left the public office for a while. And suddenly, with the start of the war, he was reinstated as the president's advisor, provided official briefings, and because of that, started appearing on my channel every day. And now, the war became the main topic of my channel, and everything else moved to the background. Turns out, as I recently found out, that behind you, in your broadcast, are not the actual bookshelves, but a photo background. Of course, I simply could not believe it when I saw it on TikTok. It was a revelation. Yes, that's because everyone was already accustomed to these bookshelves in my original office while I was broadcasting from Moscow. And somehow I did not want to change this background when I had to leave Russia. It seemed wrong. And it gives me pleasure to look at my favorite books again. There is Immigrant, Literature, Pushkin, Lalita. Of course, I cannot change the placement of books anymore. I have here the memoirs of Igor Gaidar, which he signed when he was still alive. About Alexei Aristovich, you shared that you met him on the air. Do you also keep in touch beyond your streams? Do you, let's say, go out to restaurants or meet for a drink? I have never met Alexei Aristovich in person. Really, yes. We only see each other during my streams. In the past, our interactions were more formal before the war. But now, of course, we are big friends. And we do talk outside of the streams sometimes. But it's still a business relationship. For example, I came up with the idea to raise money for the victims, which he ardently supported, by selling paintings to of Ukrainian painters through the NFT trading platforms. 
Me personally, I would never buy digital art copies. We don't collect the paintings, but simply sell digital copies online for cryptocurrency. We have already helped a number of Ukrainians, giving 2,000 euros to those who lost limbs or injured children, to one nurse who lost her leg. So this is what we discuss outside of the YouTube streams. We decide who needs our support, search for their addresses, discuss how to wire the money, those miscellaneous activities. But sometimes we still allow ourselves to have a laugh, exchange various memes about us, so that's basically what we talk about. I never asked him for some insider information. What you hear publicly on the air, that is what I know as well. And after the end of the war, will you meet in person? I hope so even earlier, but need a good reason makes no sense to arrive to Kiev just to have a drink. We need to come up with something more significant. Do you now live in Latvia or Lithuania? I live in Western Europe, so you do not publicize where you live. No, because they have threatened to kill me. Kadyrov threatened me and others. I tell them to try and get me. Of course, the Russian security service is actively pursuing me because my presence is painful to them. It is evident that they are losing the information war. So our area, situational analysis of the war, is a very important subject. Not as important as what Zelensky says or as the official briefings of the Ukrainian army, but our analysis of the situation from the position of the Ukrainian authorities although often unrelated to some frank insider information, is very important. It's similar to what the Moscow propagandists are doing, but they have obviously lost. Hence, we see their frenzied reaction to all of this. They are compelled to invent fake stories like Aristovich is a seasoned gay, this is their common practice. They do not know what to do otherwise. Their goal is to try and discredit the person because they cannot cover the actual truth that Russia has lost thousands of people, that their flagship cruiser Moscow had sunk apparently because of a sailor's cigarette. They could have had a chance to win the information war if they told the truth. But in these systems like Russia, which is your typical dictatorship. It happens more and more often when behind the gloss of the facade appears your traditional totalitarian face with despotic elements. They cannot afford to tell the truth in principle, even if they wanted to. If they had to today restructure their information policy, they wouldn't know how. You know how I judge our success? My YouTube audience is becoming younger and younger. Before the war, the age of my audience was on average 45 to 55 years old. When the war started, my main audience turned 34, 45 years of age. And now only 1% behind it is the audience of the 25 to 35 year old ones. This is a very young audience, which means the way we cover the war appears a lot to this young and very active population. There are also a lot of Ukrainians who watch my channel more so than the Russians. So the Russian propaganda is lost, and this is very unnerving for them. I'm not talking about where I live. Not because I have something to hide. If desired, it all could be fairly transparent. But there are other important factors in play. The Russian government is trying to instigate criminal proceedings against me for the so-called fakes. 
they declared me to be a foreign agent for not following their laws, and other char charges are pending. So this is my tactic, to stay hidden. Do you stay in touch with your ex-wife and your son? I make an effort. Are they still in Russia? Of course. Is it safe for them? I don't know. It's impossible to answer. Have you thought about relocating them somewhere else? I will not talk about this on the air. Why unnecessarily bring attention to this topic? What's to happen for you to return to Russia? Putin needs to die. That's number one. Secondly, things need to get into motion, as we say. I will definitely come back, but not in order to prove something to someone. That's very important. I tried to convince my buddy Alexei Navalny as much as I could. I did not think that after being poisoned with Novichok, he should return. There are different ways to return. Alexei Navalny returned to prove his case, which is a very archaic method. He will remain forever in history because he certainly knew what would happen to him. All the talk about that he had some assurances from the Western politicians, perhaps Merkel, that he will not be imprisoned, was not true. He was immediately put into prison there. My opinion is that it was necessary to remain in Europe to be able to return to Russia on tanks. Understand? Come back to defeat this power and destroy all of them. We should talk about this openly. Because everything else, yes, might have some significance as a kind of a example of how a responsible Russian politician should act when he is against the war and the state. But it's absolutely meaningless because your example will not necessarily affect all of the goals that you put in front of you. But the return to Russia in the lead of the civil war is a different story. I do not see how the change of power in Russia could happen without the civil war. So I would be very happy to participate in this kind of return. No questions. Mark, am I correct in thinking that Russia will once again come out of the water dry, come out of all of this unscathed? They always go unpunished. I think not this time. Because despite the huge resistance that is also present in the West, attempts to come to an agreement, and every time an agreement that favors the West and to the detriment of Ukraine, still something very important has changed that will make it impossible to rewind the situation. First of all, sooner or later, it had to all come crashing down under its own weight, just how the Soviet Union had collapsed. The Union was not dismantled by someone arbitrarily. That's nonsense. It could no longer continue to survive. I was an active member in the political opposition, anti-Soviet, anti-communist organizations during the last years of the Soviet Union. And I assure you that many republics hated each other, did not want to live with each other. All these tales about their friendship were dead a long time ago. People were looking for ways to go their separate ways. There were military confront confrontations. A lot of things were happening, that's a fact. Therefore, today, Russia is going through a similar period, but in a different way. In any case, any war always serves as a trigger. Any effort to start a war like the one with Afghanistan by the Soviet Union or now with Ukraine by Putin stems from the conviction that you will win. Defeat is always unexpected, but victory is predicted. So the military defeat is rather the very thing that will not be possible to rewind, to undo. That's the key. The defeat will trigger inevitable processes within Russia itself. Plus, we haven't talked about this, but Putin finds himself in the late phase of his life. He is the core of the whole system, that's a fact. He turns 70 this, year's, this year, so his state of health, I think, is not remarkable. To spend a quarter of a century as the head of government is stressful. We find today's situation stressful. Now imagine how it is for him, the feeling that all of this can add sadly. I do not believe that the external calm he is trying to portray reflects his actual internal state. The stress devours him from the inside. 
And so I think there are too many factors to allow him to come out of the water dry to go unpunished.